So, hi everyone. So exciting to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us for another conversations on decoloniality and fashion with a very, very exciting topic, I think, this evening, or at least for me this evening, for some of you this morning. Um, yeah, so I mean, most of you are familiar with the conversation, so we just want to take a moment to be respectful for everybody's journeys, processes of learning and unlearning, and especially to be grateful, I think, to have this space, to share this space together. And um, yeah, so again, today, we have Sarah Cheng with us and Shahnaz Sutirwala, who are going to talk about their um, joint or co-authored article uh, on decolonizing the curriculum, transformation, emotion, and positionality in teaching, which was part of the special issue of um, fashion theory. So Sarah Chang is the head of program in the history of design at the Royal College of Art in London. Over the past 20 years, she has taught fashion history at a variety of higher education institutions, including the London College of Fashion, with a constant commitment to inclusive curricula and transnational fashion research. And Shahnaz Sutirwala is senior tutor uh, in critical and historical studies at the Royal College of Art in London. And her research explores radical politics of the body in contemporary culture. And currently she's working on a book of experimental decolonial feminist writ in. Shahnaz is co-founder of Open, a decolonial research initiative. And so today we have Erica who will be um, doing the questions. So Erica, over to you. Mm. Thank you so much, Angela. And just um, uh, greetings from our co-convener, Shana Gonzalez, who just can't make it tonight, but she's with us in spirit. Um, and so I'd really just like to welcome um, Sarah and Shanaz. It's so great to have you here with us, um, joining us. Um, and, and hopefully we can just unpack some of these. You know, I think your, your article really presents so many opportunities for us to kind of um, think through a lot of the things that we've really sort of explored throughout the year in our monthly conversations. So maybe just I'd like to maybe just begin with opening up the conversation a little bit on sort of some of the reflections of what you referred to on, on page um, 891, if anybody wants to go back to the, the um, article itself, but you talk about our emotional practice, um, it was embodied, it was personal. And I think it's such a, an interesting place um, for us to maybe engage with decoloniality, not necessarily just in terms of teaching, but also in terms of learning, um, that this idea of embodied practices um, in terms of, of your work as teachers, but also you know, in terms of students and their learning, this kind of embodied practice. You mentioned how these approaches allowed you to respond to questions like whose knowledge counts as knowledge, whose truths are believed and whose truths are discounted and why. And, and that these very particular kinds of shifts in thinking about emotion and practice um, allowed you to kind of sense the world differently. So. My question to both of you, you know, I'm um, really open to, to um, how you want to respond to this, is how do you feel this emotional practice allowed for perhaps a kind of first step towards transformation in your disciplines? So maybe um, Sarah, if you'd like to start. Great. Yeah, sure. Well, and thank you for amazing question and I, I want to also say thank you so much for having us here today and thanks to all you guys for coming to talk with us um so 
there's two bits to that, I think. First of all, um, how we're working with the idea of emotion and why we're working with emotion. And then secondly, what we might do with our students to engage um, the body and the and emotion. So there's kind of two bits there. Um, and if I start with the emotions, first of all, as a, um, a way to think about decolonial transformations, I, I first of all, and recently again, have, have been going to Sarah Ahmed's work on the politics of emotion. And I really think that, you know, what, what she's writing about is the way that our emotions are politicized, uh, historicized. And when I say emotions, I'm, you know, I think she's thinking of you know, feelings of wrongfulness or shame or harm or uh, wounding, these kinds of areas, um, you know, and then, when I'm teaching, I'm thinking a lot about how these emotions are involved, these kinds of emotions are involved when you're speaking out. And, you know, I think if any of, you know, if we have, feel we have a teaching practice that could um, be thought about as a decolonial practice or moving towards a decolonial practice, then it does, it is going to involve speaking out, speaking back at times. And so how the emotions are engaged at that moment of speaking out of telling whether you're telling your own truths or whether you're hearing other people's truths when you're speaking back against established truth um you know what's causing the pain what has caused pain what are the roots of pain how we're contesting social norms and so on and i think that what sarah ahmed says really strongly is that emotions are embodied thought and then that to me is really crucial this idea of emotion as embodied thought so as soon as i want to think more along the lines of you know, the decolonial agenda being about transformation and about contesting a whole set of structures that structure knowledge and structure thought and structure our sense of you know how we are in the world then I can kind of go to this very strong sense of the embodied thought through the emotion and um, so for me this is before we even start talking about decolonial thesis um, I for me just working from Sarah Ahmed I can see how I want to work with emotion as highly embodied and an incredibly potent place and a very important place to, to think about. Um, and I have one more thing to say um, on that point, which is about um, not fetishizing pain and not fetishizing emotion either. So it's really about engaging emotion, I think, um, and understanding how to read emotion or speak emotion or uh, work with emotion. How to, when, when to act on it, when not to act on it, these kinds of things. And this is, you know, a lot of where the transformation occurs, I think, as well as it's in the kind of the recognising the emotion and then the engaging the emotion and the acting on the emotion. Um, I'm going to pause a moment and let Shanaz jump in. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to Angela and Erica for this really kind invitation. And it's a real pleasure to be here this evening. Um, partly because I don't get to see Sarah enough. So it's always wonderful <laughs> to have a chance to talk with her, but also I don't think I've had a chance to meet any of you. So thank you for giving up your time to come and join us this evening on what I think is um, a really interesting topic. And thank you, Erica, you've started us off with such an interesting question. I'm so pleased that Sarah mentioned Sarah Ahmed because Ahmed is uh, referenced in our article and she was a very important scholar for us to be engage with, engaging with when we were thinking generally around ideas of affect. And as Sarah thought, uh, has, has already said, this idea of embodied thought was so critical for us as a starting point. You also, Erica, mentioned the word practice, and I would like to just pause on that for a second, because we, Sarah and I work in an art school, and so we are very used to thinking about thinking as practice. And what I mean by that is the idea of making thought or the idea of making actually has been really centered in the way that we go about constructing um, not only our work, but also the kind of discourses that we might want to engage with. And so practice for us is something that is part of our affective economy. Um, it is the way that we embody thought, and it is part of our vernacular 
in iterating the way that we want to live the theories that we're engaging with. So that's uh, one way that we started to think about this idea of emotion, as Sarah has already said. The other way was just to draw on um, traditions of auto theory that, of course, are present outside of decoloniality that have a very long standing history, for example, through feminist thought. The idea that you can be embodied in theory and that you can practice it through your body is something that is so beautifully articulated, for example, in performance art. And so um, I think we've lived within the ecology of these sorts of thoughts for a long time. And it was a really excellent um, an opportune moment for us to start to unpick and unravel what this might mean to us as practice, both in the classroom and in the way that we were crafting and drafting our article. Mm -hmm. I think that for me personally, emotions came together as practice and as this auto theoretical display of thinking or embodied thinking, if you like, um, by focusing on the present in the moment in which we were teaching and in which we were writing. I think that there is an autobiographical um, reveal that needs to take place when we are reading theory and when we're, when we're engaging with it. And by that, I think that what I read five years ago, when I read it now, I read it differently. And that's mm -hmm. all to do with where I am in my own present moment. And to me, that is emotional. That really determines my embodied thinking. And it's not that the text has changed, it's that I've changed. So I wanted to just bring that into the discussion because it was really important for us in the way that we were trying to locate our own self-reflexivity, both in the classroom and in our writing, in the way that we approach this project. Sarah, I hope I haven't misrepresented you. No, it's beautiful. <laughs> There's always a danger in collaborative work. <laughs> Not possible, no. <laughs> mm. But I, I think what's what's so interesting is is um, how by bringing attention to this um, emotional practice as a kind of um, new form of thinking um, in in the teaching space. Um, speaks to the volume or the, the scale of the negation of emotion in teaching. Mm. And, and I think that that's what you're, you know, you, you're, you're highlighting how, how absolutely essential or key or, or central this thing should be, these, these acts should be um, up against a huge, vast space of, of, of its it's exclusion from from teaching yeah i think we, it's such an important point that yeah yeah i kind of want to bring in at this point a, a, an event that chanel's and i did in a huge lecture theater as part of our uh, the open initiative um and we were drawing very much on decolonialist thesis in our thinking um and one of the things that we were doing was taking the, the lecture theatre, which is this, this dark space of disembodiment where you're just supposed to be uh, like a brain, a floating brain in a dark space with no substance. And then you sit down, you receive intellectual ideas. Um, and we play, we turn the whole lecture space on its head. We have all that, we had all the lights on, we had the audience on the stage, we had the the, the lecture formed up um, amongst us and the audience in a in a really different way. Um, probably not explain this very well. We were running around the lecture theatre. We were playing games in the lecture theatre. We were doing all kinds of things to really engage um, embodied thought, let's say, um, amongst ourselves and also amongst our amongst our colleagues as well as our students. I mean, another thing that I think is really important is the way that we're constantly trying to work. Um, not just in a, a very didactic way of I'm here as the teacher to teach the students, but to teach you know across the institution in all kinds of ways. Um, sometimes ways that this institution doesn't, doesn't expect us to, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Which is the point, probably. Yeah. 
Mm. Maybe maybe this this um, goes quite nicely into into my second question and and you know as a lecturer myself and having experienced very similar kinds of tension points and and sort of stubborn institutional limits um, and very sort of dynamic of of student expectations. Um, you wrote also about how you allocate. You used your allocated teaching hours in ways that had not perhaps been intended to be used, but we were teaching nevertheless, we said, you know, this repurposing is both decolonial and subcultural in texture. And to now maybe, I mean, I, 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 I also, you then sort of expanded on that and sort of spoke about how you manipulated subcultural studies and pulled it towards decolonial studies. And I'm really interested in this concept of repurposing, um, perhaps not just, you know, the, the repurposing of, of the teaching hours, but the repurposing, Sarah, as you were saying, you know, the repurposing of the spaces, um, the, re the repurposing of texts or key concepts or, you know, repurposing of power dynamics in, in these kinds of spaces. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm even sort of thinking around repurposing of fashion objects. This, this idea of repurposing is such a powerful, and, and Shanaz, maybe you want to, to talk to this a little bit. Thank you, Erica. I think it's fascinating that you've picked up on the idea of repurpose. I think that that is really worth us pausing and considering attentively, perhaps, for a moment, because there are many words, many of them from subcultural studies, that speak of appropriation. The idea that you take something and you use it to your own effect. Repurpose, for me, suggests something slightly different. It does suggest that there is an active engagement to perhaps change meaning. And I think that that was very much something that uh, was at the back of our minds and also at the forefront of our teaching. So I think Sarah and I emotionally and intuitively understood that the work that we wanted to do in the classroom was bigger than just a short course or a six week program that we were writing or a collaboration in the classroom that, the, that we were doing by bringing fashion studies and subcultural studies together. We did want to create a new purpose actually to our teaching. And that was to find a point of connection between ourselves and between our students. I think that was very much foregrounded. It was also about thinking of new forms of criticality. We understand what criticality might mean in orthodox disciplines. It's literature reviews, it's pulling lots of opposing views together, it's doing lots of footnoting and showing that you've read material so that you can create an argument within a particular discourse. We know those skills, we've had them and we've been trained in them. So what does it look like to decolonize that? What does it actually mean to do that on the page? in the way that we speak to each other, in the way that we speak to our students, in the way that they hear us, and in the way that we listen to them. And so I think it absolutely was a repurposing in that we, we did set out with a different purpose. You can call it an agenda if you like. <laughs> there was a certain sense of um, that there was a political dimension to it because we were taking on a decolonial brief. And equally, there was an activist element to it because we wanted it to be disruptive. And we wanted the, the repurposing to be a new paradigm that was bringing that stuff together just to test it. We weren't necessarily going to be right. We weren't going to be successful. We weren't going to be able to wrap something up into a really neat new conclusion, but we wanted to test it. And that's why the word practice actually is so important. We were prototyping something. It felt right, that's where it started. But then we could substantiate what we were saying because we could draw on scholarship that we did pull together because we could find points of connection and we wanted to explore what those were like. Oh, I'm also thinking about the repurposing of, our, of, of the structure of the college as well, because we, in order to to do some of the activities that we wrote about in our article and that we also did with um, with open 
we you know we we didn't just work with other tutors but we worked really actively with librarians and um in particular i remember these very these incredible meetings we had with the school manager do you remember shanaz and and how um how important and how activist those meetings were so talk, we were working with our administrators working with 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 a number of support staff working with technicians um in ways that were all really part of um a kind of a you know just a different way of a, a repurposing of the team perhaps um in ways that really really pushed pushed us into new areas mm -hmm. such a yeah such a um, um productive place as well um it was very productive because it was also in that repurposing, which is such an active thing to do, there was a dislodging, there was a sense of creating, um, actually of taking us out of our own comfort zones and um, finding new terrains, you know, finding new fertile grounds and starting to become active thinkers in that space because we were outside of our comfort zones. So actually, we couldn't be passive as teachers using material that we may have taught before in previous years or using bits of curricula that has been tried and tested, we had to rethink it. Um, and part of that was also exposing vulnerabilities, showing what we didn't know. Um, by Sarah and I collaborating, I, we could draw fault lines around where we were scholars and where we weren't. And I thought that that was a very important part of the decolonizing transformative emotional process actually and i think that i don't know how others find it or whether you would agree but the ivory tower uh, university <laughs> system doesn't necessarily allow for vulnerability it allows for excellence it encourages the idea of the expert and um we weren't able to be that person if we were teaching courses where our research wasn't located in those areas, but it did allow us to still have the conversation. And I think that that therefore led to a slightly different kind of conversation. Mm. And a different yeah. set of resources as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much um, really in, in interesting stuff that maybe we'll expand on in the, in the breakout room as well. Um, you know, just I think one last um, sort of thought that I, I I wanted to maybe bring in um, in this conversation is this this very useful model that you worked with and and model um, and and you spoke about how it it also opened up um, and it it kind of also expands um, and and I'm thinking of of it as an expansive um, space as well um, Angela and Shana and I. Um, took part in the digital multilog and a lot of the um, works or the workshops were constructed around this same kind of principle, theory and practice, bodies and belonging, design and thinking. So, so being and, and belonging. So, so these kinds of and and spaces. So I don't know if, if um, Sarah, you would like to maybe come in on, on, on how that might have continued, maybe even like beyond the particular course, but you know, just in some of your, your sort of ongoing work. Oh my gosh, yeah, no, it's so important. Um, I mean, for me, it's, I mean, and, and for me, really means that you can embrace the possibility that you can't pin it down. So we're not, it's not, and, or, it's not, it's not, is it appreciation or appropriation? It's, it's appreciation and appropriation. So we're not gonna close it down. We're not gonna say it's definitely one thing, it's definitely another. It's about embracing, it enables you to embrace mistakes and contradictions in the classroom and more widely and intellectually. And it means that you avoid reductive thinking and you're not looking for an answer. You're not looking for the definitive thing you are always opening yourself up to the idea that you know we're able to practice to speak to recognize the complexities of life you know 
and those complexities are really real and they're to be engaged with rather than they're just to be resolved and closed down. And this is what's so important to me. And I was thinking about um, and and again recently in relation to Maria Lugona's work, um, you know, this idea of the plurality of the self, the plurality of worlds, the different worlds, a sense, this different sense of of, of world, um, the idea of being is in the world, what's my world, what's your world, how can you can how can I be in your world, how can I understand your world, and so on. And um, and I was thinking that ultimately and and for me enables that sense of uh, you know acknowledgement of of that of of a plurality of selves and a plurality of of kind of beings and the role of um, yeah, I mean, uh, Lugonis talks about playfulness, but that that sense of that you could be both enabled to be health, healthy and playful in the world and at the same time not because of this plurality. So and and it's really important that you're not trying to pin yourself down and other people to a, a kind of this or that, or there's got to be an end to it. Um, and that ultimately to me, this is the this is the key tool in disrupting knowledge disrupting structures, navigating towards something. And this is really transformational for me. And I work with it all the time. I think it was important in the Rethinking, Global, uh, Rethinking Fashion Globalization book that, that we did recently, Erica, um, you know, that being able to hold that space that even, you know, decolonizing is not this or that. Um, you know, it's not like it's decolonizing or it's not. Actually, let's open up to the idea that there's, there's this decolonizing and there's this and there's this. Um, and there's actions that are both decolonial and colonial. Uh, and this is the whole, I mean, I think this is so, for me, it's really crucial. Um, another area in which I think it's important, I'd love Shanas to jump in here, is, is, is in, um, okay, in the peer review uh, comments for our article, go, to, go back to our article, um, some of the comments were really wanting us to pin things down really resisting the and 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 really looking for we want um we want evidence uh, we want evidence of transformation um we want takeaways we want a guide to teach you we just want you to give us uh, five pointers on how to teach decolonially um and we want to know if it worked or it didn't work actually we want to open up the idea that it worked and it didn't work um Shiraz, i don't know if you want to to jump in here um Oh, thanks, Sarah. That's it's such a great way of summing it up. And um, it, plurality really was the, the thing that we were thinking about so much, wasn't it, when we were having those discussions about and and. And mm -hmm. um, when we got the peer review comments, we were we wanted to keep the ideas loose and in some cases messy, because we felt that that was really important that allowed for generative thought that allowed for us to keep an and and approach but also we thought maybe the reader would want to have an and and approach maybe they'd like to believe mm -hmm. some of the things that we've written and not maybe they'd like to agree with us and not and we really welcome that and i think um when the peer review comments came through there was a sense not only of tidying up the argument giving a sense of takeaways and solutions. But also I think structurally, I would like to, to just make a comment about the writing style, the form and style of expressing ourselves um, was not done in the orthodox and traditional way that journal writing and academic writing takes place on the whole. Um, we locate ourselves, we write from the personal, we uh, move between voices as the two authors. We are anecdotal. We bring the historical in and with the contemporary. And I think all of these things also on review were slightly challenging to our peer readers. They were things that while people wanted to really engage with decolonial work, um, perhaps this was something that was a bit too foreign. <laughs> and so the question becomes, how do we do this and the other? How do we ex write and make and express ourselves in ways that we feel are the practice of decoloniality and get published and get mm. heard and enter a discussion. Yeah. Um, fantastic that, that uh, this wonderful forum is a place for that, but they are quite 
few and far between still, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so of course, this is this is a question for all of us that uh, who are working in this space. Yeah, and we've pushed, we've taken this further, and, and um, something that we're it's it's been through peer review, and we're just looking at the final edits to give back to the journal. But we, uh, Shanaz and I, and, and um, Livy Rosende and, and Katie Irani, we've written an, another piece called. Um, Gosh, what have we called it? In between breaths. And then um, we've taken this even further in terms of mixing up the voices, using a lot of different approaches to writing, uh, completely uh, throwing down, you know, throwing a massive challenge to, to the journal and to the peer review. Um, it's been a really interesting process. Uh, and it's all, in some ways, it's almost slightly disappointing that they're still going to publish it. I feel like we might have done something wrong. But at the end of the day, we've worked really hard to try and communicate the ways in which we're breaking the rules because this is the point, is to rethink the rules. And we seem to, um, we, well, we'll see what happens if it finally comes out. Um, I just want to say one more thing about and and. Um, and it, well, sometimes I think people think that I'm saying, oh, anything goes and, and that you just you just float around and you have no fixed position and, it, you, you know, you, you're not you're, you're you're frustratingly just like slipping and sliding and not actually stating your case and stating your point. I don't mean that at all. I think you have to always pick a side. I think you have to take a side, you know, um, are you, you know, you, you, you're going to defend a decolonial position. You, you're definitely taking a side. You've got a particular objective. Your, your objective is to, um, I don't know, destroy racism and capitalism and you've, you know, imperialism. It's, yeah, there's, you've, you, you do need to take a side, definitely. But what I think and and enables you to do is take that position, have that, you know, know what your activism is about, know what, what you're doing and why. But the and and enables you to, to then work out you know, the lived reality of that position and, and how there are still going to be so many contradictions in your life. And when you enter the classroom and you come up against all these other people's worlds and you've got your position and then how are you going to work together and work through this and um, together um, achieve tremendous transformations, multiple transformations. And this is, for me, and and is really crucial for that as well. Mm -hmm. If I could just add one more thing about and and, sorry, we could and and just keeps on giving. <laughs> um, as Sarah mentioned, we were asked for, by our peer review committee, we were asked for evidence of transformation. Well, they're just microscopic and they're at a meta level, right? So that's really where the and and comes into play. Where would we stop describing? what the transformations may have been. It could have been a micro conversation that someone had peer to peer. It could have been a comment that we felt free enough to say this year in our teaching that we had never said before. And the list goes on. It could be a new reference that we've added. Um, it could have been references that we've boldly taken out of the reading lists to make them more opaque, to make them open. Reading lists that, that are themselves generative, you know, and, and goes on in, I think, all the minutiae of everything that happened, both in the classroom and how this article got to put together. And actually, because of that, it was never going to fit into the word limit <laughs> of any article. So um, I just want to sort of draw that up because I'm very grateful to everything that was generated through this process as evidence of my and and, and therefore as evidence of my transformation through it. Mm -hmm. I think also what's what's really productive, I mean, what's really generative of it is um, how it, um, it was a teaching moment, which is very much about the classroom and the curriculum, but throughout the conversation you're talking about the, the whole ecosystem of academia, because you're talking about the journal, you're talking about the institution, you're talking about the library, you're talking about the students, you're talking about like the afterlives. Of, of the course um, of, of, of engaging with peers and colleagues. So it's, it really is the, the, the entire ecosystem um, that starts within um, a, a particular teaching moment. So I think, I think there's so much more that we could probably um, discuss, but I think maybe Angela, maybe if you wanna just maybe think of a, a 
question that we can share in our breakout rooms. I think I think we'll go into breakout rooms, but maybe if, if there's a question that you'd like us to maybe think about in the breakout rooms, or if you'd like to add something. Well, I think there was already so much uh, material there to to take into the uh, breakout rooms. No, I mean, I really like what you just kind of like summarized of the whole ecosystem, like when it's not just you right in your teaching but that teaching is actually within an institution and that institution and it's not even i think only the the teaching even if you think of the museums uh, you know who also where maybe one curator really wants to do things differently but then you know uh, hits all those different other departments who uh, think differently so i i think uh, yeah maybe if i can give something for the breakout rooms is these ecosystems how you are not it's not only about you <laughs> but the institutional and so how you can um how do you say that involve them in the process and i think already you you gave a few uh, hints and, and, and examples of, of your own experiences but i think that's definitely something we all are confronted with right the the whole ecosystems because the pluriversal as you're saying in your how it already uh, met resistance in the peer reviewing i think that is also what we we um we hit on on a daily basis right when we are working with or through or um decoloniality it, it it hits a lot of resistance because it's disruptive right it's transformative and that um, also comes along with fears and with resistance again so ecosystems is that an idea <laughs> so yeah 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 should we um 